I had my first existential breakdown in the parking lot of a salad bar in Colorado. I don't think I even ate a salad. I just remember putting my hand on the handle of my car and not being able to get out. I leaned my seat all the way back and started crying uncontrollably. I stayed there and I cried for two hours. And then I drove home. Everything Everywhere All at Once is a title you can get lost in. It is a title that, befitting the vibe, has no punctuation. There is no stopping this train. It is the most literal film title since Georges Méliès made A Trip to the Moon. It is If Chaotic Good Was a Movie, No Thoughts Just Vibes, Magical Sensory Overload, and yes, the directors of Everything Everywhere All at Once are trying to destroy your brain. Everything Everywhere All at Once is a movie which should definitely have a seizure warning. It is a movie that will show you the universe and tell you it has none of the answers. It will make you feel like nothing and like enough at the same time. Which is true. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? I am paying attention. So, what is this movie about? <laughs> well, Everything Everywhere All at Once is one of those movies where what happens in it and what it's about are disparate things connected by a thin thread of total chaos. I'm gonna borrow from online reviews because they all say the exact same thing in the exact same way. Which is okay, and accurate, and that's what a summary should be. So, take it away. Everything starts in a familiar kind of universe, where Michelle Yeoh is Evelyn, a Chinese-American laundromat owner. Wait, no, I like this intro more. The film opens with chaos. Evelyn Wong, an overwhelmed matriarch who runs a laundromat with her sweet, even-tempered husband, Waymond, is arranging a Chinese New Year party for her customers on the same day that the laundromat gets audited by the IRS. <laughs> Every review smushes Evelyn's ordinary world into one sentence. <laughs> Poor Evelyn. Evelyn is drowning under the stress of her family's failing laundromat, her ailing marriage, and the elderly father who disapproves of her life choices. It's very true to the film. Her life gives a very smushed into one sentence kind of vibe. Her marriage is failing, her relationship with her daughter is on the rocks, and she's constantly doing whatever she can to earn back the love and respect from her father. Joy is openly gay and wants to introduce her girlfriend to her ailing grandpa, Gon Gon. But Evelyn is reluctant to acknowledge Joy's queerness, telling her daughter that she's very lucky your mom is open to you dating a girl. During an IRS meeting with the formidably eerie bureaucrat Deirdre- Wait, one more thing. Her full name is Deirdre Bobeirdre. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that you knew that. It says it right here on her butt plug trophy. We're gonna talk about the people who made this in just a little bit. Okay. Continue. Evelyn is initiated into the rules of the multiverse by an alternate reality version of her husband, who urges Evelyn to help defeat the powerful but unstable Jobu Tupaki, creator of a black hole bagel capable of destroying the multiverse. Oh, thank you, fleet of movie reviewers. Uh, wait, what's that last part? Here's the thing about these plot summaries. All of that is what happens in the movie. None of that is what the movie is about. It's not about saving the multiverse. It's not about an omnipotent world-hopping entity named Jobu Tupaki. It's not about a bagel. What it is about... Well, every viewer seems to pick out what they felt was most important to them. Their abouts are very different and equally huge. It's about finding meaning in the absurd. It's about the information overload of the internet. It's about the cycle of intergenerational trauma. It's about losing faith in God. It's about queer erasure. 
These are some serious abouts for a movie whose antagonist is a bagel. But the innumerable readings are appropriate, given that, well, all of this is in the film, but especially given that this is a movie about infinity. And in the middle of all that possibility, a finite you with all the terror that implies. Set against the daily undercurrent of dismissive customers, domestic repairs, taxes and laundry, and taxes and laundry, when the truth of the multiverse reveals itself, Evelyn is confronted by the uncomfortable realization that her life could have gone in so many different ways. And is she happy with this one? It all coalesces into a familiar feeling of pressure. Pressure to live up to our parents' expectations, pressure to be your best you, pressure to find the meaning in life, pressure to fix things, yourself, your family, your marriage. And as Evelyn follows her daughter deeper and deeper into the abyss, the innumerable directions of her life crashing in on one another into an incomparable symphony of Evelyn's all playing in and out of sync with one another, everything visible, everything asking for her attention. A billion choices screaming to be made and just the barest flickers of quiet where anything seems to make any sense where she can spend a few spare seconds to look at it all and ask, Wait a minute, what was the point of all this again? Hey, um, does anyone know why we're all here and what we do now? How do Evelyn and Joy pull themselves back out from the abyss? Do they even want to? This movie, to me, is about this feeling. It's about this one specific moment. An existential crisis is actually a pretty common experience. <laughs> Shocking that the human brain, a machine evolution narrowly calibrated to perpetuate its own existence, has difficulty with the concept of unself. It's no wonder that so much of the field of philosophy has fixated on death, on a single moment at the terminus of our lives, on a phase that none of us will experience because there will be be no us to have experience. When your understanding of the universe is predicated on, facilitated by your own consciousness, I think it's natural for the ego to become repulsed by the idea of a universe without you. You can't stop. You can't end. You can't not. It's no wonder that so many of us spend the time before death letting it influence life, the thing we do get to have. That's what had me crying in the salad bar parking lot that one time. My internal sense of meaning had been miscalibrated. Or I guess at that moment I realized that I never had one. And so I, I was, I was joy. I sat there trying to figure out, if it all goes away, then what's the point? Don't stare too long into the bagel. And in a meta turn, the writers struggled with this very question, what's the point, during their years-long scriptwriting phase. Because metaverse movies were, in their opinion, uniquely susceptible to existential doubt. In a movie about the infinite multiverse, in a movie where everything has happened somewhere, every choice has been made, everything has been done, how can you convince the characters, and the viewer for that matter, that anything has any meaning? Once you make a single life so small, how do you make meaning that isn't equally minuscule? And without meaning that is large, what is there to... <laughs> Just, what is there? And actually, that's where the writers had their breakthrough. What if we made a multiverse movie that went so far that it went to the conclusion of, well... Everything Everywhere is the brainchild of director tag team Daniels, aka Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert. Known for their collaboration on music videos like this one. That's Daniel Kwan, by the way, dancing guy, that's him. 
and for their other films like Swiss Army Man, in which yet another Daniel, Daniel Radcliffe, plays a farting corpse on a deserted island. So, yeah, these guys are pretty weird. It's called uh, Spaghetti Baby Noodle Boy, and it's a universe where a talking macaroni uh, doesn't understand why he's not a spaghetti. This also isn't the first time Daniels have done a multiverse film. In 2016, the duo developed the short film Possibilia, an interactive love story set in the multiverse, in which the viewer is trapped in the throes of a cyclical breakup told through multiple diverging timelines. Where are you going? I'm going! The viewer navigates through branching paths in the spirit of what if I just said this one thing differently, generating branches upon branches upon branches until ultimately following them to their nightmarish unified conclusion? Oh, I can't leave. I can live in this moment and its possibilities forever. Just dwelling. A familiar feeling, isn't it? Where are you going? I'm going! Multiverse movies are more popular than ever. Spider-Man did it, twice. Or, well, two different Spider-Mans did it once, each. In 2019, we had Avengers Endgame's whole deal, and the TV show Loki greenlit its own multiverse concept in 2021, which Doctor Strange followed up on in 2022. But in drafting their multiverse feature film, Daniels got frustrated by what they saw as the multiverse problem. I don't care about multiverse movies, Daniel Kwan said in an interview with Fast Company. Once the multiverse is introduced, nothing matters. There is no choice. And a character is nothing without his choices. So everything's watered down. Daniels felt that multiverse films were squeezed between two monumental problems. One, they're incredibly complicated to pull off. It's easy to fall for the allure of high concept science diagram techno babble magic system wishy wishy special effect. And two, perhaps because they are so heady, Daniels felt that a lot of these movies lacked heart. So they leaned into it. They leaned into it hard. They crashed. They exploded. They rammed headfirst into it. Shinet recalled, What if we made a multiverse movie that went so far into the idea of an infinite number of universes that it went to the conclusion of, well, nothing matters. And then from there, said Quan, they wondered, can we as filmmakers pull them back and give them a hug? I do prefer my depressing stories with a cherry on top. If a movie is going to take me into the depths, I like when it puts my hands back on the ladder before it leaves. Don't get me wrong, there are some phenomenal examples of movies and shows and books that withheld the hug, that took me far out to sea and then left me there. Inside actually fucked me up for a few days after I watched it. That special made me feel depression in a way nothing else ever has. Aside from, you know, my brain. And while I'm impressed that a Netflix special was able to get me back to such a bruised and folded over place inside of my own head, I ended up leaving it thinking, did the special want to take me to this place? Is that the mark of a good performer? Someone who can get me to empathize so successfully and wholeheartedly to the point of pain? If a piece of art wants to take me to that dark place, <laughs> when, if ever, should I let it? Is this good for me? Is this catharsis? There's no real answer, of course. Art isn't supposed to do anything. There's no right answer to how do we tell stories about depression, existential angst, and feelings of hopelessness, information overload, intergenerational trauma, losing faith in God, queer erasure. <laughs> no singular answer, because none of us have the same path to brokenness. You might think, that's what the comedy is for. To undercut the pain. Have a guy run on screen and make a fart sound. Bam, the tension's diffused, no threat of feelings. We can move on. There's a concept called bathos, which involves that feeling of anticlimax created by a sudden mood shift from serious business to jokey jokes time. The damage is not too bad. As long as the foundations are still strong, we can rebuild this place. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
the, now those foundations are gone. Sorry. But can laughter serve a purpose other than to trivialize difficult moments? We are rolling. Sound speed. Can we throw in a joke to fan the flames rather than to suck all the wind out of the conversation? Can humor help prepare us to explore the questions that terrify us, unzip our guard, be the spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down? The most important thing is you gotta give the people what they want, even if it kills you, even if it empties you out until there's nothing left to empty. No matter what happens, no matter how much it hurts, you don't stop dancing and you don't stop smiling and you give those people what they want. And action! Why aren't you dressed for school, Prickly Muffin? I've always loved the admittedly incomplete, admittedly imperfect theory that humor comes from harmless dissonance. As in, we're confronted by a strange reality, an oddity, something absurd, something unexpected, something that should not be, that flies in the face of logic, and we come out the other side, okay. It's the relief when the dissonance is harmlessly resolved. It tickles our brain. We can hold it inside our heads and turn it around and around and delight in it because it can't hurt us. Years of and maybe these shows and movies know that there are some times when you can't make a joke. There are some moments when laughter falls down. Some dissonance is not harmless. A gift shop at the gun range, a mass shooting at the mall. But humor and philosophy have always gone hand in hand. Maybe there is something essential about laughing that allows us to go safely into those deep places. Or maybe it's not that deep. Maybe humor is just a complete accident in the evolutionary chain, and we're all just lucky beneficiaries. And you know what? <laughs> That'd be kind of amazing in its own right. Or maybe, really, humor is the closest we can possibly come to comprehending the status of the human race amidst cosmic infinity. It's all a little ridiculous when you look at it. Let's discuss. Thanks for watching. This video is absolutely going to get demonetized, so if you like what I do, consider pitching me a couple bucks on Patreon. Patrons get access to the drafts of all of my videos, so you can see how these change over time, which is sometimes very significant. They also get access to some videos that won't be released on the main channel. I'm almost done with an hour-long video on Fate the Wink Saga that just isn't a good fit for the main channel, but I had a lot of fun making it. So if you want to check it out, the link's in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you next time.